Okay, well, uh, let's kick off uh, this afternoon's webinar, the another UK webinar. That's our fourth this week, uh, fourth out of five. Where we're doing, having lots of fun and lots of interesting topics. And today's topic, I think, is going to be particularly, um, particularly relevant at the moment, and also one that, that uh, I, th I think will be greatly enjoyable. And we've got a great panel of uh, speakers this afternoon. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, but Justin Harley from from Yardy and Christian Armstrong and Ian Gibbs from Get Living. Um, and, and what we're debating today is the topic of how have brand operations and technology come together during COVID-19? Um, it should be a lively debate. Um, just a couple of bits of housekeeping rules before we start. Um, as you can see from the screen, um, I always forget to introduce myself. I'm Dave Butler from the UK, but I think most people probably know me. Um, anyway, so a few housekeeping rules. There are, as you know, uh, on, for those of you who've done webinars before, um, Q and A set opportunities and uh, chat opportunities. So, if you've got any questions, and we've had a number sent in already, please do use the Q and A function uh, down there. Justin, will, who will do most of the management of this today, will be picking up those questions and asking them as they come in or as they're appropriate. Um, and any we don't answer during the session, we'll try and pick up and give you an answer at the end of it. Um, we have done a new feature today, or a new feature to me. We're running a couple of polls during the course of the event, and we'd love to get your opinion on those. Uh, we'll launch them uh, a couple of times during the event. Um, finally, just to let you know that this is being recorded. Um, we will, after the event, make the recording available to people via the UK website and through, through Yardi's website, I'm sure, and perhaps GLL's as well. Um, so at which point, I think um, I will... Uh, just say uh, thank you for listening to me for a few minutes. Hand over to Justin to take it from there. Cheers, Justin. And thank you, Dave. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks for putting this webinar on. Uh, I'm Justin Harley. Um, uh, I hope you're all sitting carefully. You've got a cup of tea. Uh, you've got your pajamas on. You're ready to sit back and enjoy this webinar. Uh, we've got some great content for you. So. Um, I work for Yardi, and I'm delighted to have with me a couple of esteemed guests, Ian and Christian from Get Living. So, hi guys, really nice to see you again. Um, and they're going to share their experiences of um, how brand technology and operations have come together in this kind of tough time of COVID-19. So that's going to be quite interesting. Before um, uh, before. Uh, we move into to that section. There's a couple of things I'm just going to share with you. Um, firstly, uh, because I'm a bit of a nerd, I looked in the, um, the I looked up in the dictionary what brand is. I wanted a definition of what brand is, so I looked it up and I got a definition that I quite liked. And it said that a brand is a name, a de design, a symbol that identifies one seller's goods or services as distinct, keyword distinct, from those of another seller. So to me, uh, brand is really about how do we differentiate, how are we different um, in the experiences that we give our residents and our clients. Um, so, uh, so, and that, that's particularly pertinent. Um, earlier this week, I was speaking to a client who said to me, that um, I was asking how he's coping in COVID and he shared with me that uh, he thinks it's going to be the making of their business because the experience that the residents are getting now will define how they will perceive both residents and prospects them in the future. And I thought that was a really quite powerful statement um, and it echoed with me and it resonated. And, um, uh, and it'll be interesting to know what the guys uh, think about that as well. But one takeaway that I personally have had in COVID, as it, it's been an extraordinary time for everybody who's tuning in, listening, is, and maybe because I'm a techie and I work for a technology company, is that um, it's highlighted the need for all businesses to be digital ready. Um, it is critical that uh, a business is ready to go. And I am amazed how businesses have mobilized, um, thanks to tools like Zoom, uh, in this day and age. But I think that COVID has highlighted the need to be ready for anything that hits us, and technology is a really key part of that. Um, 
we can talk about Zoom and when my mother-in-law's kind of Zooming me, um, that, that's an extraordinary thing. And she's uh, 80 and can't even use an iPhone, but she can use Zoom. So that's an extraordinary thing, I think. Um, in the residential world, I think tools such as online leasing, virtual tours, um, the use of resident apps have become more essential than ever before. And now are, uh, I think, a critical part of anyone's infrastructure just like putting the foundations on a building. So I, I, I think that's something that I'm hoping to explore a bit more, um, a bit more today. Um, at Yardi, um, we provide software tools to uh, over 12 million residential units um, across the world, predominantly in the U USA with 35,000 odd here in the UK and Ireland. And I thought I'd share with you some of the trends that we've seen uh, across all, all of the software and that, that, that we manage. Um, we have a system in the US called Yardi Matrix that analyzes all the data from all of the systems and anonymizes it, but has some very interesting stats. And from, um, it, since we've been, down, it, it, been in lockdown, uh, there's some things that I'll just share with you. So app usage uh, by residents has doubled. So it is absolutely doubled. So residents are going onto the app, and that's, that's just our data, but they're going onto the app and using it twice as much as they did pre-COVID. Um, that is an interesting stat. Um, downloads of the app have increased. So people are going online, looking for your app, going to the app store, going to look for Get Living and downloading the app more than they ever did before. Interestingly, payments, so payments that have come through our technology, they've remained relatively stable. And in fact, there is a decrease in collections of 2% over the last two months. So there is a decrease. But that's, I think, not bad considering what we're going through. I don't want to be, uh, um, I'm not a futurist, I can't forecast the future, but um, how long that may last depending on, um, uh, I suppose, government subsidies and the help that they're giving, who, who knows. Uh, interestingly, work orders, work orders have decreased quite drastically by 20%. So we've seen a real reduction in work orders. And the work orders that we're getting really are much more key and urgent. Um, uh, so maybe people aren't, maybe people are kind of backing off uh, away from, from that. And the other thing which I think is interesting, the use of online tours has, has increased. And I think my key takeaway before we, we get Chris, uh, Chris and Ian to talk about it is that what's happened in COVID is that uh, technologies that we kind of dipped in and dipped out of and we thought maybe not as urgent and important as they were have, have because of social distance, distancing, um, become, an, an, an become a necessity and we've been forced to use them. Um, the interesting thing that I'm hoping to get out of today and a debate is going forward when we're out of lockdown, will these become absolutely crucial tools that people will just expect to use because of what we've experienced in COVID, such as Zoom, such as uh, an uplift in the, the virtual tours on site. So I leave you with that thought. And, um, and uh, what I'm going to say is I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about simple, straightforward, safe renting. <laughs> so without any further ado, um, the, please feel free to ask any questions as we go uh, by hitting the Q&A. Um, Dave, we can fire up the polls if, if you like. And uh, Christian, Ian, uh, lovely to see you. Over to you. Okay. <clears throat> So good night, good afternoon, everybody. Thought we'd start with a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Ian Gibbs. I'm director of neighbourhoods for Get Living. Uh, so I look after the commercial and operational performance at Get Living. Um, and Chris and I share the customer. So Chris is value creation. I am value delivery for the resident. Chris, over to you. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Ian said, uh, I am Chris Armstrong. I look after brand <laughs> and products at Get Living. And as Ian said, really about you know bringing the product to the customer, the brand to the customer. Uh, and giving it to you and the teams to deliver out in our neighbourhoods and our communities. So first of all, uh, we do hope you're all keeping very fit, well and healthy. 
Um, we're not going to use any slides this afternoon. Uh, it's going to be a fireside chat approach to uh, to a webinar. So uh, it might work better for you on gallery view rather than speaker view. Otherwise, you'll get Chris and I's face keep flicking in front of you. Uh, some of you may be on here because you read it as wine bar as an anagram of webinar. Uh, I know I have a few times, so perhaps you're here for very, very different reasons. But uh, that's OK with us. Everybody's very, very welcome. Um, <clears throat> when the UK government made the historical decision on the 23rd of March to enforce a lockdown across the country, to help protect the NHS, save lives and limit the spread of COVID-19. The lockdown really did have a significant impact on the way Get Living was operating. So Chris and I are hoping to share with you an overview of the way in which Get Living have been able to operate with agility, uh, with adaptability and instigate changes in our business support processes, our operational processes, our maintenance services, all underpinned and in partnership with technology and brand. And everything has been in service of our residents, whilst we've been supporting our teams. So at Get Living, we've been working on something that we call Match Fit for, for some time now. So we will use this theme throughout this afternoon. So there will be some sporting analogies, some metaphors, some occasional sporting puns for which I apologize in advance, uh, but hopefully it just helps bring to life some of the experiences. Um, and before lockdown, Get Living really enjoyed being close to the top of the table and vying for the top spot with our equally seeded competitors. Some of you are joining us online now, uh, but the radical, radically new opponent that we faced in COVID-19 challenged us all in ways that I don't think anybody could have predicted, not even William Hill. Um, but look, before I share some examples of how operations and technology have come together using this sporting theme, Chris wants to give you a little bit of a flavour about why you're listening to us too for the next 15 minutes or so. Chris? Thank you, Ian. Yeah, I think we, uh, we stood on the sidelines, didn't we, Ian, thinking about preparing for a World Cup, which as many people in our industry will appreciate as our summer peak. Uh, thinking all about that, uh, that customer coming towards us, and then all of a sudden we were faced with this challenge we'd, we'd never heard of before. Um, the reason we're together and the reason you hear from the two of us today is, you know, I remember standing vividly in the meeting room you know, with Ian, to use Ian's sporting analogy, we were right on the sidelines, just looking out on the players warming up. And we both just looked at each other, we thought, how are we going to do this? And it was really interesting that straight away with absolutely no um, hesitation whatsoever, we said, let's get the right people in the room, let's get everybody around the table, let's start working this through. There weren't silos, there, there wasn't even a fascination about a particularly strong response plan. Uh, it was about, let's get the whole team in and let's talk about playing as a team. You know, uh, I'm a bit of a football fan, if anyone's watched Barcelona, the total football, that's what we thought we would do. We try and get everybody involved in playing their part on the pitch. And it's really interesting because the man standing next to me, who's next to me here somewhat in the quadrant of how Zoom plays it out, uh, Mr. Gibbs, um, he was the one who, like me, just, just said, how can I help? What can we do? What, how, how, do we, how do we pull this off? So when I spoke with Justin and the team at ARD and we spoke about you know, getting, getting on board and, and supporting the webinar today, it made just absolute perfect sense that Ian and I spoke about it together because you know, it's, it's very, very true to say that right throughout the whole process, we've been working in partnership together as a brand team, as a technology team, as an operations team, uh, as finance teams, the whole organization. And Ian and I are hugely proud of that. So we wanted to share our story together today. So that's us. That's why we're here. Let's get on with it. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Chris. So linking back into uh, match fit and our preparations, look, the, the rigor of our off-season training, um, to build our organisational strength and our stamina over the last 12 to 18 months uh, has, has unpacked in a couple of ways. Physical performance, so the stamina associated with our assets and durability, you link into your rigour around PPM schedules, your CapEx life cycles, your dilapidation preparations all stands you in very, very good stead. Your mental performance, so coaching and guiding teams through unprecedented uncertainty and just checking that they're okay. Your drill regimen, so your standard operating procedures, your emergency operating procedures, your ways of working, being first in the mind to ensure the safety, security and protection of our customers and our organization and everyone who works within it. And then, you know, the use of our training grounds. So enablement of working from home, hour one, day one, achieved only through technologically advances for which Chris, you know, has played a huge part in. And look, we, we found our challenges, you know, finding the right formation for how you operate in a lockdown situation has been interesting. You know, we've looked at 442, We've looked at 532, <laughs> but I think, you know, we, we ended up at one position, 640. We, week one, we were totally defensive. Um, so we've really questioned how our front-facing teams are deployed to compete. And we've looked at who's on the substitutes bench and closely listening to the reaction of the crowd. And our crowd, you know, they're all season ticket holders in our tournament, by the way, because they're in it for the long term. So they are looking how you respond.
respond and how you come out with this. So are they engaged? Are they supportive? And are they happy with your performance of the team? We've heard, paid acute attention to all of that all the way through. And Chris, I certainly know that technology has helped us find the right formations, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely, without a doubt. Uh, I think uh, the formations require different tools, uh, different technologies at different points in time. Justin, you mentioned earlier in, in the introduction about the use of the app. We've seen that use of the app, the same trend, people downloading it, you know, in far, far higher numbers, people engaging with it. People happy to raise a maintenance job and pop a comment in to tell us that it's not urgent. Don't worry, I just need, just want to let you guys know that, you know, when, you, when you're available, come round. Uh, the use of our resident notice boards to talk to residents to make sure that, you know, in those early days, as Ian said, when we were defending every single man behind the ball and working out how to, how to cope with this thing that, that came upon us, we were talking to our residents constantly about here's how we're helping you, here's what we can do. Um, and we'll touch a little bit later, but that, that wasn't just necessarily about the Get Living Service experience. That was things about how we can help people with uh, vulnerable care packages, how we can help people that were self-isolating. It was the it was the dreaded call that we first took actually that kicked all this off about, I think we've got a resident who's self-isolating and that's where it all kind of started. So we used so many different tools at that point in time. We've been able to, to use data in our systems, data in a way that tells us what's going on. Where do we, where, are we still seeing those inquiries come in? Are they coming in more from one channel than the other? Um, what are our customers getting in touch with us about as well? Are we seeing that our emails are going up or our phone calls are going up? How do we react to that? How do we how do we put our team in the right position on the pitch to deal with the with the uh, the competitor in front of us? And then, like everyone, how do we use our technology to flex our processes to be contactless, to to apply social distancing? To, you know, we all had we all had the, the, finally the, the common sense that prevailed in the the with government around doing the virtual right to rent checks. We were able to move quickly with that and put that into a leasing process to make sure that our customers didn't necessarily have to come in touch with us face to face. Now. But just to address a point here, Ian and I both feel really passionately about, we are a service business and we love talking to our customers and we'll talk about that in a second, but, but we had to adapt and we had to allow people. We still have people who needed to move in, who, who wanted their roof over their heads and we wanted to help them move in. So being able to adapt to that using the, the range of technology that we had was utterly pivotal in terms of where we were in the job. Chris, just uh, can I ask a question just, just, just on that? Um, what's been the hardest for you as a company, what have you found the hardest to adapt to this? What, what, what would you say was the one thing that has been, oh, it's really hard? Yeah, let me, I mean, let, let me answer that first just now. I'll let you answer because I suggest you might have a second, a, a separate answer. I think, I think for me, and it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely challenge to have, but I tell you it was hard at the beginning, was how quickly and how kind of dynamically everything changed. You know, we went from self-isolation and social distancing as a message to all of a sudden we all need to lock down to... You know, people who genuinely needed help for hardship, all of that around the narrative of how do we operate as a business? How do we support our team? How do we, you know, how do we keep things moving along? You've, it felt like certainly in those first few weeks, it just felt like a, it was quite embattled at times. And I think, you know, that was, that was tough. But I think actually, in all honesty, I think the strength of the team and the approach that has been, you know, get living from the outset very much about let's get around and work out how we get through this together. I think probably saw us through that. It took us probably three or four weeks before as Ian and I, I remember discussing, said, feels like we can do something. It's a bit more like a normal job today, you know, um, but we had to do that. That's something we had to do, but I'm sure Ian's probably got a slightly different take on that. Yeah, I think for me, uh, scale comes with many benefits, but in, uh, in a lockdown situation, it comes with many challenges. You know, when you are trying to close down effectively a hamlet, you know, a small village or, or a mini town of thousands of customers, retailers, you know, with an operational management company linking into your uh, immediate community and borough, your emergency services, the schools, the doctors, the dentists, all of which your thousands of residents rely on and are largely a lot of your uh, tenants in situ. Um, and also creating safe passage for your teams, you know, by writing to the MOD with a, a letter saying, please let these people through. They are our key workers, you know, and we need them to be able to service, you know, our neighbourhoods. Uh, it's been really, really challenging. Um, and, and on top of that, you know, the teams have then had the hardship cases. You know, people are phoning up in a really emotive place because of everything that's going on in the wider economic um, uh, scenario. And it's really difficult to be able to manage all of that. So that's been an incredible challenge, partly because you don't prepare for those things. No. Uh, and and I, I, suppose, I suppose you don't prepare. And for you as individuals, what have you, what have you found hard and what have you learned from the experience? Yep, do you want me to take that one? You know, I'm happy to take that one. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I think, I think you know, Justin, it's, it's that whole um, being able to move fast, you know, that velocity when you're at distance, right? So you're trying to really bring innovative solutions to market. You're trying to deploy virtual, you know, virtual tools at scale and, you know, get your, get, you know, fire up and juice up some of those capabilities that you've got. But you're in a room on your own. You can't just bounce it off the guy next to you or the lady next to you. You can't just brainstorm as a team and bring it all together. Yet, I mean, honestly, it's also probably one of our biggest successes. And I'm so proud of the team that we've got that have actually been able to move even quicker, perhaps, and, and, and at such a high rate of quality. Um, but I'll tell you what, in the early days, just working, okay, how do we stay connected? And we'll touch on this a little bit later, but how do we stay connected with everyone in our teams? And how do we keep that focus and that energy and that drive going? You know, that, that was tough. And it took a bit of sitting down and thinking, right, I need to make sure I touch base, you know, with everyone. And we, we talk things through and, and just calving out that time because otherwise, you know, you can be quite isolated quite quickly. Yeah. And how about you, Ian? Same thing to you. What have you found hard personally? No, I think we've probably all found this as, as leaders of people in businesses, leading without being in front of people, you know, can be a little bit ineffective at times. It can be time consuming through, you know, numerous Zoom calls and you, you really start to question your effectiveness and what am I taking people's time up for? And it's no substitute for being able to walk and talk, kick the tires, you know, getting ready to get on the grid, back to sporting analogies again, you know, looking at your post-race telemetry and you're really working out, actually, is everything working? And I think you, you just feel the ineffectiveness of being able to do that whilst you're doing everything remotely because there is no substitute for being uh, absolutely together, shoulder to shoulder, you know, that, that really matters, really matters. Yeah. So back on with the yeah. match, then, Ian. back yeah. to that formation, back to you. <laughs> yeah, so look, after working, on our, after working on our formation, you know, we're with most players now operating from the changing room, which is their living room or the garden <laughs> from now on, look, we, we took an absolute look at our team, so the players. Um, and I must say that we were able, fortunately, to rely on the bench strength in our teams and the number of caps that they've got between them to help maintain, you know, what we feel was the, uh, the small advantage that we had. Uh, and what do I mean by this? It's the, the breadth of experience from other sectors. Chris cited this earlier. You know, we're an experienced business. You know, we're not just property. Um, and this has been invaluable to us in coming together and forming the right set piece to be able to take possession and then drive the business forwards. Um, and look, one thing I would say to bear in mind at the moment, you know, the, the transfer window, if you like, you know, is, is open. And, you know, with regret, there is an abundance of talented players who are out there and, you know, they are through no fault of their own up for grabs right now. And, you know, my, my only point on this is that the breadth of experience is hugely invaluable. You know, Chris and I are both non-property old timers. You know, we're from hospitality and leisure. Um, this is where Chris and I put in the outlaps, you know, but we've been able to pull in, you know, all of our different past experiences, you know, on crisis management, on stakeholder comms, on your customer comms, uh, how you've had empathy and compassion for your teams, um, when and it needs balancing with commercial performance. Uh, not to say this doesn't happen in property, but my experiences of leisure certainly, uh, you know, the assets find multiple ways to look to harm the occupants as soon as you open the doors. So uh, being able to understand all of the risks and operating out of crisis in different sectors has really helped. Chris, I know you brought a ton of um, experience with you, tech experience in particular, that's really helped us be agile and adapt. Anything you want to share there? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think a couple of things. I think having the right tools to do the job, it's often uh, forgotten, but I think, you know, we went through a process, uh, thankfully, uh, about, you know, 12, 18 months ago about getting people equipped to be mobile, uh, to be on the go. And, um, you know, we've, we've got a platform and we've got systems and apps that allow us to work almost entirely in the cloud, uh, fully SaaS based, which has been a game changer for us. <laughs> the ability for Ian and I to look at, you know, contact flow and be able to switch it to another team or, you know, that, that, that came real for us when we had teams that were, you know, depleted because of self-isolation and, 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 you know, poor health that we had to move other, other members of our team in to support them. But we could do that by getting online into the cloud, tapping the buttons and off we go. And, and, and you know, we weren't in that position sort of 24, 36 months ago and a lot of the investment that Get Living's put in has, has paid off there. But also some, some exciting new stuff like, you know, we mentioned the app earlier, but also our Get Living Assistant. So our Get Living Assistant is built on the Google Assistant platform. Uh, it's deployed last year uh, with the opening of our new um, product at Victory Plaza in East Village. And we've got that program with over 200 answers that the resident can tap into about, you know, what's open, what's going on in the local area, what's happening with, with transport. Or even simple things before you go out for what used to be your one daily walk, as Boris used to tell us, you could check the weather on your Get Living Assistant. <laughs> And it's true, and Ian and I were joking about, you know, that the, you know, Ian touched a lot about oh, my favourite sport, Formula One, there, and the, the technology and the, the cloud-based systems and how they how they can measure, you know, what's going on. They can move things. They can do it while the car's flying around a track. 
Well, in many, many respects, because of the technology stack and, and the platform we have, we can do that also, whether, whether Ian happens to be in the southwest of London and I'm in the north, uh, northeast, doesn't matter. We can still connect, we can still work together, which is important. So back to you, Ian. Yeah, yeah. I Sorry, Ian, just to, just to interrupt, just, there's a question in, and I, I, I'm going to pose it, uh, pose it to you. Um, the, 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 the person asking the question has remained anonymous, mm. okay? <laughs> we don't know who it is. The question they're asking is, um, isn't there greater efficiency, have, have greater efficiencies been found in homeworking and enforced IT innovative adoption in short order? and the enforced IT innovative adoption in short order. Yeah, right. I think, yeah, I mean, as the tech leader, let me answer that first and Ian can add if you wish. I think, but yes, I and mean, 100% yes, and there's some wonderful articles, some great webinars, some great content. You know, some of it has been said in UK webinars already that we've all of a sudden had to accelerate that pace of change and that IT innovation. Um, and homeworking has, I think, become and I think slightly scary if we were three years ago, what, what, what situation would be in, because some of these technologies wouldn't necessarily have been available or as mature to us, such as this, such as Zoom. Um, but I think we have, we're, we're going through what is now an accelerated experiment at virtual working. And I think we find from, a, from speaking to our residents, people were beginning to really think about how they, how they want to live and how they choose to live. Um, and not just necessarily doing that slavish commute all the time and not necessarily being in that, that pressure cooker um, all the time. So I think now people are experiencing it, absolutely the demand for you know, better IT solutions, IT you know, adoption, bringing that innovation to the fore has just been thrust into the spotlight. Uh, we had some, some of my colleagues will be listening and I'm sure we had a few nervous moments at the beginning thinking, will this all stack up? But also we were then able to start thinking, okay, let's push, let's push new stuff. So I think that's a good thing because I think Justin, that puts us in a really, really promising position when we come out of this. You know, we get into that phase. Yeah. Yeah, and I think just 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 to build on that, um, and I'll take it from two different strands. I think if we look at how our teams are now operating and their deployment from you know home, you know, we, at one point we had pretty much 100% home working. Um, you know, and we use the data and the um, the science as the government keep referring it to to tell us whether that's working or not. You know, and and we've had some of our best NPS scores, our best response times in terms of service level agreements for being able to answer our phones and respond to our residents by deploying our teams at home. Um, so that's quite indicative and granted there are some things which we aren't doing at the moment because you can't physically do those but you know it still does indicate and ch challenge your normal MO on how you're going to operate um, at what times you might deploy your teams and, and I think if you also then look at the just the clear head time that you get um, from not having to get onto a commute you know you find people are former more productive lots of people that we're having conversation with on a daily weekly basis are saying I'm just getting traction through a lot of stuff because I'm able to do it at home conversely you know, there's, there's also the devil in that where you feel like, you know, today rolls into tomorrow and tomorrow rolls into the next day and the differentiation between the weekend and your home time and your family time does get eroded. Um, and that's something that we need to be mindful of. You know, we set a bit of a rule in place where we said, look, let's try not to book any Zoom calls after three o'clock um, to give people the time well, to... Like that. That's a good idea. It's, it's still it's, a challenge, though, Justin. No, it's still a challenge, yeah. I'll, I'll be honest. Oh. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> I'm all for that one. No Zoom calls. That, that means I'm finished for the day. Great. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's the headspace um, and, and then I think if you if you apply the same thinking to residents and how residents are going to use space in the future very very differently when you look at the journey through your public realm into your retail into your amenity what you put into your amenity how it's enabled to uh, facilitate home working um, your connectivity through all of your wi-fi and broadband operations into your home and how you use that space how you furnish it there are huge connotations which I think uh, we can grab hold of some of those right now and some of those are going to stick. They absolutely will. And some of those I think will evolve as we see what happens as we emerge out of this situation. So, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, I think. Is the, uh, I think uh, just, yeah, I was just going to say, Justin, I think it's fair to say that, you know, it's not, it's not all been homeworking. I think maybe, Ian, I know you want to touch on just, we, we haven't just always had, you know, people just working homeworking and remotely. We've had teams who I think have been providing a, a a huge service to, to our residents who are still based on site in our neighbourhoods. Ian, I know you want to touch on that, don't you, very briefly? Yeah, I, th I think that, again, to, to draw the sporting analogy, it's you know, your medics, your sports doctors and your physios. You know, uh, hour one, day one, we put our maintenance and our RNM teams, um, some of the Manco teams on site. 
Um, we did that as a very, very swift decision because we knew we had the, the key surgical skills to support, you know, the, the lifeblood, the vital organs of your neighborhood, which is your utilities, your power, your HVAC, should something happen. Um, they were pitch side, they were ready, they were prepared. Um, and this include also our stewards or our security teams. So, mm -hmm. you know, they were ever ready, ever present, you know, and it's interesting as time has evolved how the social behavior of residents in lockdown did change, you know, from people being very, very quiet, non-existent, then through to the Thursday claps getting bigger and bigger. And then you start to get the little antisocial behavior bits starting to come out of the parties as lockdown went on. So having your teams on site to be able to help and support you with that, you know, has been absolutely key. Um, and I think we've also seen the adaptation of what is a really critical role and that's the coaches and the managers and the club owners you know they've all supported the direction of travel and I can't underestimate or, or pass on enough thanks for for all of the support in there and a lot of people have adopted the, the player manager um, principle where you know you've had team leaders you've had managers you've had executives dipping into the deepest parts of the operation more so than ever before because they could because they wanted to and because they cared so um, no, I think uh, you, you couple that with the, the on-field coaching team, which, you know, all of us now are moving into uh, well-being and mental health management. Um, you know, never more important, I don't think now, has been asking three simple words in a question, which is, how are you? You know, it's, it's been so important now, and most crucially, never more has it been, <laughs> never been more important to really care about the answer and listening to what people say, because you want to understand that your teams are okay. Um, and that's something that I think we found hugely important because people miss the locker room chat. They miss the banter. They miss the camaraderie. You know, they found this hard. They found this really hard. And I think they'll continue to do so. So we all have an obligation to be front and centre and support. You know, some players are also on the pitch. You know, they're one nil down. Uh, they're trying to make their way through the field. You know, they've got the under sevens team hanging onto their ankles, asking the rule of the games. Um, you know, they're asking exactly what is the equator and is it that really that big blue line in the sky? You know, it's tough. <laughs> to work at home and they've got kids with them but it's the reality of where we are at the moment and it's just so important to put all of those support mechanisms in place we, we did a very simple thing by sending across i say we the chief exec did this uh he sent a little lockdown package to every single team member it had pencils in it for color therapy it had chocolate in it because it's chocolate yeah it had a personal message of thanks from the ceo and uh, quite comically a little pack of seeds in there to uh to let everyone try and grow their own toilet roll plant. It, it was super simple, really fun, effective, and the appreciation and the goodwill right. that came from that was, was Um, Ian, there's another question that uh, we, we've got, and it's from um, George of Black Horse Mills. And it's quite an interesting one, actually. And he's, he's asked, um, do you think the same standard of uh, resident experience can be achieved while allowing staff to include working from home in their rota? Um, it, it depends on which way you would measure it. Um, I've, I've cited before, you know, earlier on in this um, this webinar that um, we have had some of our best service delivery um, through our technology enablement, our NPS scores. We, we measure our overall experience, and they've been some of the highest we've had for an eighteen month run. So I would say yes, absolutely. Um, my caveat to that would be that the, the fundamentals of not only the team to team interaction, the person to person engagement. Um, and I guess your development towards your whole experience should not be underestimated. So yes, absolutely. Well, I think we'll take all the advantages that we've gained from deploying our teams, certainly in a different way. Um, and look, I think as we come out of this and the way that Get Living and a business has, has handled and looked after their, their teams throughout this, we'll put everybody absolutely front and centre in the best place to want to serve the customers because, you know, they're the only people that will tell us whether we're performing or not. Um, so yeah, I think we absolutely already have learned something, and I think we continue to to do so. One of our, Justin, one of our, one of our, um, the things probably Ian and I uh, have lo have loved uh, working with the most in the past few weeks has been we had a conversation Ian and I this this whole point about you know, sometimes you can't separate the two of us. We had another, another one of those crazy conversations where we thought, hang on a minute, we've got a, a group of you know really in tune service professionals with all the tools and the kit, the headsets, the laptops, the connection to to the system to be able to talk to our residents. Why don't we just call all of our residents? Why don't we just give everybody a call and just see how they are? And just ask those questions. How are you? So, so we did that. So we started doing that in maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago now. We started yep. our teams just taking 10, 20 calls a day and just calling a resident, just saying, hi, it's, you know, it's Ian here. Just want to see how are you? I'm just calling to check in and see how you are. Anything we can do for you. Just Lovely. want a bit of an update on what we're doing. And it's some of the feedback and some of the, 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 the you know, the, 
that we hear back from our customers about how that's made a difference to them. And that's been, that's been right across uh, the teams from general managers all the way to, to relationship management teams, hearing that feedback come back direct that actually it's really lovely to, to, to know that you're just out there and if we need something, we can, we can still get you. And it's just a simple phone call. It doesn't cost yeah. nothing really at all, you know. And, and actually, I, I think that's brilliant. And I think as a technology, we must never forget the human element is so important. You know, you can automate all sorts of things, but you, you have to do, the human element has to remain in everything you do. Yeah. And I think, look, it's also just one thing. It's not just about the service experience we deliver to our residents, but we feel very strongly about, you know, how we impact the wider community and the community we, we, we operate within. So we've, you know, we've been able to, I've mentioned the vulnerable care packages, but we've also been able to make some significant contributions to, to food banks that trust really, really needed it, you know, across Salford, across the, you know, the Elephant Castle area, Stratford Newham, where we were based at East Village. We were able to, to actually make a, a personal contribution and help out. And I think that's important. It's not necessarily always just about what's inside your, you know, your, your firewall, your domain. It's also about the bigger, wider community in the area you play a part of. And, you know, Get Living's always been about that, you know, and about doing the right thing. So that's something that I think we've built, you know, relationships and partnerships there that will, that will endure. I think to um, just just to add on that, Justin, if I may, um, you know, don't underestimate the power of, of Zoom with your residents, particularly in hardship and you know when dissatisfaction arises. You know the in person, so to speak, the face to face you could put um, in front of somebody to handle something rather than just over the phone has a material impact um, because people are surprised at the approach. It humanizes it, and actually, it means you can have a far better, far more constructive conversation when you really need to, um, when you're not allowed to, you know, sit in front of someone and have that coffee. So look, it's, it's it's a thought to throw out there that there is huge impact in having. FaceTime, for want of a better expression, through you know this media um, to help when people really need you, or you know when we got things wrong. Yeah, no, that's true. And in, in terms of um, just on that, Ian, in terms of using Zoom and, and making contact with a resident, have you um, have you been running lots of events through Zoom and things like that? Quiz nights, dr virtual drinks, and and tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, we, we've had uh, quite an interesting um, shift change in uh, in our events program, and, and all credit to um, our events manager who's running that with his team. Um, we, we've shifted very much to a virtual proposition for all of our events, um, and some of the numbers which we've had at some of our, our attendees in events, we've had up to 500 people attend a quiz night up to 100 teams again again attending a quiz night. Uh, you know, we've explored things like speed dating, you know, which, which certainly I know raised a few eyebrows initially, but, you know, uh, it's well monitored, it's well moderated, you know, it adds absolute fun. You know, we've had craft workshops, um, photography workshops all undertaken virtually. Um, and I think the, the important factor with that is that the reach to the sheer number of people um, doing it virtually and on online has far outweighed, which sounds like I'm stating the obvious, but far outweighed the, yeah. uh, the reach that you would have in any of your amenity spaces. So there's huge amounts to be said for running that events program uh, digitally. Chris, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, just to mention about events, just we've also, you may have seen some of the footage from the club for Cadles. We've, we've, you know, we've been an ardent supporter of that across our neighbourhoods and you know, we were on BBC, uh, ITV, other, other, other you know, national outlets for just the community at East Village, everybody who's been a part of Get Living from the beginning to, to today has played a massive part in creating that community there. And, you know, we're, we're proud of the three communities we have, but seeing, you know, seeing East Village and seeing people come out onto the balconies and, and clap and share and you know, just that sense of, you know, together, you know, has, has been phenomenal. And I think, as Ian said, that sense has been uh, somewhat tested quiz night. Uh, and if you're interested, you can still register for our date night. You can still register for our speed dating. Uh, we're coming at the end of the month, but, uh, <laughs> but it's good. Good fun. Yeah, it's good fun. Um, and I think, look, it's important. And it's, it is, again, just demonstrating that our commitment to, to our customer and to our resident is to keep them connected, you know, to keep them feeling like they're part of, you know, something that's, you know, it's worth their investment. You know, this is super important to us. I have another question, actually, which is, which is um, one that I, I got prior to the webinar. And Dave, you might need to turn your uh, mute on because it's coming to you, actually. You thought you were there comfortably and this one's for you. Um, and uh, it, it is a question for the UKAA, actually. So um, this one is, uh, and how will the stewards of the industry, I like that, you're the steward of the industry, 
industry. Congratulations, Mr. Stewart. Um, how will you ensure that the current drive for technology is not lost when things return to normal? Tough question, that one. Yeah, yeah and, and I'm, uh, I think glad for the sporting analogy. I'm not sure whether it's a steward's inquiry or something. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the guys that you and, and Chris and Christian and Ian have both hinted at this, that, 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 how, that the effect of COVID-19 has been to cause transformation in our attitudes to technology. Um, we had a session yesterday from uh, Blue Ink, one of our part tech, tech partners, and they were talking about the technologies they have adopted to actually make their business work. And I think we've all done that. We've all talked about Zoom. I mean, nobody five, six weeks ago, I think, had ever used Zoom apart from maybe some people had. But that, um, that, all the other things we have adopted, and I think it's that pressure of that necessity will keep on doing that. If I think about it from an operator's perspective, um, my sense is that we are going to be under real pressure to keep costs under control. You know, the things we're going to have to do in terms of effect social distancing in our buildings is going to be real, provide real pressure. The, the core of that is what do we can do, adopt in terms of technology to make that change? I mean, certainly from a personal perspective and from a UK perspective, our objective is to try and promote technology to assist people to adopt technology. We can't force them. That will come through economic circumstances and through, and, and through investor pressure and through from, from, uh, from resident pressure as well. And we've talked about the desire of residents to communicate with us. You know, it won't go back the way it was. There will be, for at least a few years, at least, a need to communicate effectively. I think the other side will be that the technology behind the scenes. Um, I think Chris used the analogy of uh, racing cars and things being able to manage things in progress. Um, I was looking at uh, Prop Moto magazine this afternoon, which is one of the, I think, really interesting magazines in the States. And it was saying that the big pressure, the, the, the top 10 requirements from the asset managers going forward, are that they, they have changed. And now they're looking for remote access um, and, and real-time data. Those things will be pressures that we put on us and we'll have to change. I'll help it, but I'm, you know, I'm only a steward. <laughs> I'm not an investor or an owner at this point in time. Does that help? Just no, I think that's great, Dave. Thank you very much. And sorry for picking you on your own. No, that's fine. <laughs> can, I just, uh, just, can, I, can I maybe just add to something Dave sure. said? If you, if you haven't subscribed to it, you don't follow Prop Model. It's one of the best sources of content, isn't it, Dave? It's, uh, some of the articles they put out they aren't just necessarily technology related, but about you know, the impact of what's going on. That's a, that's a, a fabulous suggestion from Dave. I would, I would highly recommend that. And for those, just to add to that, those of you who don't subscribe, I, there tends to be a number of articles taken from there that are in the, um, uh, the news post. Brilliant. Th thanks, uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, that's great. So, um, uh, uh, Chris, I've got another question uh, just popped in, uh, slightly on a different subject, um, but I think people are probably inspired by your story actually and i think this is a, a good question have you done anything different or special for nhs staff who live on your um on your sites yeah justin i'll um, i'll answer this one <clears throat> um we, we've been fortunate to have an ongoing relationship with the nhs of varying trusts for quite some time um, so, uh, yes, we have had a preferential partnership, um, which has a plethora of benefits and opportunities for all NHS workers from the UK and also internationally, um, which we found has, uh, has grown in terms of its popularity and therefore its value. Um, uh, and obviously we reached out to uh, Nightingale Hospital as well um, uh, during uh, the construction stages. Thankfully, we weren't needed, um, but um, for all the right reasons. But, um, but yes, you know, in terms of our relationship with the NHS and supporting all of the key workers, absolutely, that has grown from strength to strength. And uh, we really hope that will continue to grow from strength to strength as well through our uh, preferential partnership. Yeah, that, that just that, that key work, that key worker element, that key worker discount element that the partnership allows is really important because it makes it makes that home offer more affordable for that group. Uh, and just to supplement what Ian's saying, it's not just about the NHS worker. We're also very proud to have a relationship with Francis Crick Institute over at St Pancras. Yeah. And we've had about a wealth of uh, scientists coming from from all over Europe to try and find what we all hope will will finally come across one day, which is a vaccine or, or some degree of treatment to, to cope with uh, the COVID nineteen outbreak. So. Um, in terms of having, you know, the, the Crick Institute scientists and, and team on board also, we're, you know, that's something that we're proud of and, and we work really hard on that relationship alongside the NHS. Brilliant, thank you. 
And I suppose um, um, another question that I have, uh, I have here, um, which is quite interesting, and using your football analogy, as we move into next season, um, do you feel that you are equipped uh, better to handle if anything happened like this again? Do you, do you feel you're much better equipped? And why? Um, Chris, I'll step in first on this one. Uh, to an extent, yes. Um, look, we were in the game. You know, we could operate, we could transact, we could call, you know, we could listen. Uh, some of our players did go out through injury, you know, and we did have some of the things that had to give in terms of r and and decorating. Uh, there were blind sides, you know, a bit like Scotland's performance in the recent Six Nations, where, you know, there were some things that we just couldn't have predicted, you know, the, the PPE stocks. Um, so look, I do think there are some learnings, absolutely. But, you know, when you go through something of this um, unusual nature, it does help you prepare and think in a very, very different way. So look, if, and I sincerely hope Wave 2 is not uh, something that any of us have to go through, but, you know, should that be the case? Uh, I think all of the disciplines and the execution and the learnings that we've put in place stand us in a very good stead to be able to deliver. Um, and it will be far more, dare I say it, natural than our ability to be able to switch that on. Um, and we'll also have a much broader scope of all of the requirements that are needed, you know, when you're operating at scale. So, so yes, I would say. Yeah, we've also yeah. just been able to capture a lot of the learnings from, from where we are now. We've, we've done a a kind of learning assessment already uh, just because we wanted to get it while it was fresh we wanted to kind of get it into a box and we've seen some of those changes already now filter through to our brand standards and how we operate so we're already making that a permanent change which is great there's other things where we've gone actually you know to Ian's point we could have been sharper we could have been better there we could have been better prepared so we'll take that forward and, and close that gap and there's other things where we've gone damn it that was a great idea why don't we just keep doing that you know things like those calls you know why don't we just keep doing that we keep talking to people you know it doesn't you know, um, that doesn't cost us anything we said earlier. So um, I think I think to, Ian's right to an extent, yes. But, you know, I, none of us would want to sit here and say we've got a PhD in hindsight. I think we'd all love to have one, um, but we don't. Um, and therefore, you know, we just have to do our absolute best to, to capture everything that we've learned from where we are today. So as we kind of move to um, to, to uh, the end, I, I have, um, I suppose, a question for you both. Um, one, of, one of my questions is, would you agree with the statement that um, brand um, technology and operations have come together? And I suppose I'm going to elaborate on that. Do you, do you think that it's part of COVID or do you think that is just a part of business? Yeah, I said, it's funny, I said this earlier and I were talking in some of our earlier prep and we kind of said, you know what, interestingly enough, in built to rent, I would say, which is a real strong point, I think it's, it's quite prevalent. Um, you know, I see a lot, a, lot, a lot of colleagues, peers in the industry, people I, I you know, respect hugely, that operate in the same way, you know, and, and, and don't have those boundaries. And that's really great. And I think, look, absolutely, that technology layer has completely and utterly, you know, broken down a lot of the boundaries and brought that online collaborative element together. Um, you know, even just video collab tools like this or online tools like Trello, we can all, you know, track what we're doing in terms of projects and tasks. You know, it's completely to, to, to it down. But I think also if you want to operate as an organisation that, you know, in today's market and be competitive and think three to five years ahead, you can't operate any other way. You know, you have to work together. You have to be more of a, of a matrix organisation and much less traditional hierarchical just doesn't work anymore. Uh, you do have to shift, you know, your position and shift forward. And I think a lot of us are doing that. Um, and, you know, in Build to Rent, I think we've got a lot of success coming because of that, because of how we operate. That's a great, it's a great point. Uh, good. Ian, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah, look, I, th I think we've, we've seen a shift change um, through uh, an unprecedented situation. Um, there, there was certainly chemistry before between the operation brand and technology. Um, I think what we've seen is uh, a different um, proportion of alchemy um, during the lockdown situation. So all of a sudden now you feel your recipe is a bit stronger. Uh, it's far more cemented and you know what the outcome is going to be. So, um, so look, for, for, from that analogy, absolutely. Look, I think there are huge learnings to take from it. You know, brand technology and oper operations aren't in silo they're not separate you know they're mutually inclusive you know and they cross over and chris and i always find ourselves you know, particularly when we introduce you know we talk about sharing the customer you know because we do we absolutely do it's not his it's not mine you know it's it, it's the principles around doing the right thing operationally for your organization measured through what your customers are telling you you know and it's all underpinned by the technology you deploy um and you know, the, your tone of voice and your message out to market so uh, absolutely yes Okay, so um, I'm starting to wrap up here. So if anyone does want to ask any questions, please, please 
to them now. I, I, Ian, I have, um, I have, I have an, a question just, just come in, which is, um, have you had to deal with any residents who think they may be going against the stay at home rule? Um, for example, parties. Um, and how have you dealt with that, I guess? Uh, we've been very fortunate that we've had limited to to no um, antisocial uh, elements. I think our biggest challenge has been um, with the realm uh, and the public realm and the green space that we've had across our neighbourhoods, because uh, the message was very clear about your one opportunity to go and exercise and, and please don't dwell. Um, and and you know, we are fortunate enough to have expansive space where people really want to dwell. Um, and, and that's been probably our biggest challenge, I would say. We're, we're fortunate that overall everybody has been very well behaved. Um, and I don't mean that in a patronising sense. They genuinely have. You know, they've, they've got together, they've united behind the Thursday clap. Um, but our challenge has been on the public realm. And, you know, sometimes that's our residents and sometimes it's people who are passing through. But our links in with our, um, our community policing, you know, the policing that we have on site at East Village, um, all of our security teams, uh, they, they've all helped in the right way, I must say, you know, support uh, all of the principles that the governments have advised. So that's been our biggest challenge is people wanting to sit outside quite naturally in the green space. Yeah, yeah. no, very difficult, very difficult. Now, as we as we draw to a, a close, I thought we might actually have a look at our poll results and see um, see what uh, what people have answered on the poll. So hopefully people have been filling in uh, and answering the questions as we've been going. So uh, Dave, I think um, uh, you're our man. So let's have a quick look. First one is, have you found working from home easy? Yes. 67% um, yes. Any comments on that, Jets? Yeah, that, you know, it's interesting. That, that probably changes with what we see internally um, in terms of what our teams say as well. And so that's, that's very representative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would be in the Sundays camp, I think, on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, uh, some days I'm yes, some days I'm no, some days I'm some days. <laughs> yeah. I think all of us, throughout the course of the week. You, yeah, all of the above. Yeah, I think you do, as, as you wish. Yeah, yeah this, this one, I, I suppose, uh, I suppose it's a difficult one. Um, are you excited about returning to work? I, I think that probably means the workplace rather than work, because I assume you are working. Yeah, I think just on that one, I just think, uh, you know, the story uh, yesterday, most people have seen about Twitter now allowing employees to work at home indefinitely, Facebook until 2021, etc. I think everyone really is saying, you know, like the IT innovation question earlier, everyone's saying, well, from a working standpoint, you know what, actually, you know, I, I could do this differently. I know, Justin, you're the expert to talk to that, you know, with, with the, the, you know, the flex space and the co-working piece, but I think yeah. you know, there, is a, there is a real revolution coming there in terms of office space. I think there is a massive re re revolution coming. So, and then, um, how regularly have you connected with uh, residents? So, an interesting one here. Um, so, 28% um, say daily, 17% weekly, 6% uh, bi-weekly, and um, no monthly. So, I mean, I think that shows where we're going, you know, to, to what you guys, it's consistent with what you guys have been saying. And how have you stayed in contact? Which is interesting. So we have a, a mixture, a mix of the above, yeah, which is probably the, um, probably consistent. That's interesting. Okay, cool. All right, so, all right. So um, any other questions before I uh, say thank you to these? Oh, I've got another one that's come through, so I've got time for it. So um, have you implemented anything? And you alluded to this earlier, actually. Um, have you implemented anything for the well-being and mental health of your residents? Chris, do you want to tell that one? Yeah, we absolutely have. Uh, we did uh, care, care packages which were dropped off uh, to residents uh, recently. Um, I think of the examples uh, that came out of our uh, Newmaker Yards development in Manchester, people posting to Instagram. Uh, how thrilled they were to get the uh, simple comforts of things like a bar of chocolate delivered to their door. <laughs> um, so, you know, get living colouring in for adults, all that good stuff. And uh, some of our team did a phenomenal job on that. So big shout out to our team on that. Um, we've had online fitness, online classes, which I know a lot of our peers, all of our competitors have had. We've got some yoga coming up online shortly, if anyone's into a bit of uh, yoga. Um, Ian and I are personally a bit worried about we might never get back up if we do the yoga, so we won't be taking part. But uh, we've, got, we've got a young lady who's highly respected uh, in terms of yoga classes, doing some online piece as well. Um, you know, and we are always, you know, really, we always work really, really hard to stress that a lot of our green space, a lot of our open realm that Ian talked about is really so important to mental health well-being. And that's why we've tried to keep a lot of those areas 
well kept and open and secure and safe for our residents to get out and enjoy. But I think like everyone, we've, we've kind of pivoted to put that, that fitness and that health element online so people can still take part and enjoy it. Great. Right. Right. And I think just, just to add to that, the, um, the type and frequency of your interaction and communications. So we touched on earlier the you know, we're into the thousands now of calls that the team have made to just check in with residents. There's been no other agenda than how are you? Do you need anything? Um, and the way that they've been received has been overwhelming. Um, not necessarily what we were anticipating when we first started it out. Um, and then also there's the, you know, the frequency of comms, you know, timing that in, uh, in a very timely way post government changes and government's announcements, you know, leading into really good weather. There's a really fine line to tread between, you know, being over um, preaching in terms of your communications of please remind, don't do this. And also, yeah. you know, sharing a lot of the good that goes on and what's happening um, and all of the work, you know, the, the clap for Thursday, uh, sorry, the clap for carers on the Thursday, yeah, we've had an opera singer and we try and highlight a lot of what's going on that people just right. want to see and appreciate. Fabulous. Sounds really great. And, and I, I've got one, uh, one last question, if no other questions pop up in the poll, and, and I'm intrigued. Um, are you more like Jose Mourinho or Jurgen Klopp? How would you, uh, where would you see yourself in the, in the management style? <laughs> Well, if I, if I was to take off my Get Living sponsored background from here, you'd probably spot my Liverpool memorabilia. So there is only one answer. Uh, I, I would definitely be Jürgen. I think that, that, sense of, that sense of getting your arms around everyone, you know, working together, and, you know, but, but also you know, really, really trying to drive and trying to make a difference and trying to you know, make sure that you can compete at the top of the table. Uh, for me, without a shadow of a doubt, I am a 110% Kloppite. I am following Jürgen all the way, so that's me. <laughs> I don't know about Ian, you. same question to you. Well, to be honest, Justin, Ian sports, supports an inferior sports team, so, so I don't have <laughs> the same answer, but we'll, we'll pass it over to him, Ian. I'd love, love to hear your answer. Let, let, him talk, let him talk, Chris, please. <laughs> It's the wrong sector for me, uh, wrong shape ball. So uh, now I think if, uh, if I was to draw an analogy for me in terms of uh, not necessarily manager, but player, I'd probably cite back to one of my heroes, Lance Dahlia. Um, you know, was always out on the front line, you know, would put his body on the line, supportive of team, you know, strength of character. I'd, I'd put myself in that situation, but uh, that, that's being very, very modest, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, look, um, I, I want to thank you guys for taking part in this and actually for being so candid and open and sharing what you have done uh, in creating great neighbourhoods um, and a great service. So thank you so much for taking the time. And Dave, thank you very much for allowing us to take part and showcase these, um, these guys. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I I'm glad you started the analogy about, about managers. I was in scribbling names down on my piece of paper and uh, I wasn't sure where I was getting to. I mean, I was thinking about Chris, where could I call him? Was Ian McGeekin would be more in the, uh, the right line. Um, and Mr. Gibbs, well, I'm not sure about Lawrence Delaney. I was a long time Leicester supporter. Um, uh, wouldn't necessarily be my favorite person, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. There we go. Um, I think uh, you guys have touched on a lot of the time is, is this connection with technology and things, but, but, but even more than technology, I think, has been the sense of um, uh, authenticity. It is that sense that we genuinely care about our residents and genuinely care about what we're doing in our teams. And that, for me, is, is one of the real things about this sector, that it is about people who care about each other. And that'll be one of the things that that sense it translates itself into community and one of the things that will uh, keep the sector going for well for the future. Um, anyway, so the, the, we're coming towards the end of today's session. I think we've got a minute left. And um, if anybody wants to get in touch with uh, Yardi or with Get Living London, um, then let us know and we'll put them through to them. Um, uh, the other thing that I have to say is uh, this, is the, so this is the fourth of five webinars I've done this week. Uh, tomorrow morning, we've got a really interesting webinar hosted by Homemade, which is all about winning the rental market, um, winning uh, in a post-COVID recession, um, which is both intriguing and hopefully uh, will be very positive. But apart from that, I'd just like to say thank you very much again to, to Justin, to Christian and Ian, um, to Hannah for organizing all of this for us. Um, it's been a very well-organized, remarkably well-organized webinar. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.